This meeting is called to order. Thank you for attending this public meeting of the United States Sentencing Commission. The commission appreciates the attendance of those joining, joining us here, as well as those watching our live stream broadcast on our website. As always, we welcome and encourage the significant public interest in federal sentencing issues and the work of the commission. I'd like to start by introducing the other members of the commission. Uh, to my, my immediate left is Commissioner Rachel Barco, who is the Siegel Family Professor of Regulatory Law and Policy at the New York University School of Law and serves as the Faculty Director of the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law at the Law School. To my immediate right is Judge Charles Breyer, who is a Senior District Judge for the Northern District of California and has served as a district judge since 1998. Uh, to my far left is Judge Danny Reeves, who is a district judge for the Eastern District of Kentucky and has served in that position since 2001. And finally, to my far right is Zachary Boletho, who is the ex officio commissioner from the Department of Justice. Commissioner Boletho serves as Deputy Chief of Staff and Associate Deputy Attorney General to the Deputy Attorney General of the United States. The first order of business today is a vote to adopt the January 19th, 2018 public meeting minutes. Is there a motion to do so? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 Any nays? The motion is adopted by voice vote. The next item of business is the report of the chair. Before we begin our hearing, I would like to update the public briefly on some of the commission's most recent publications and actions. Since we last met in March for the second public hearing on proposed amendments, the commission released two new publications. One publication is related to mandatory minimum penalties for federal firearms offenses. I discussed this publication at our last meeting and encourage you to read the report's full findings that are now available on the Commission's website. Another new publication is titled Recidivism Among Federal Offenders Receiving Retroactive Sentencing Reductions, the 2011 Fair Sentencing Act Guideline Amendment. This study analyzes the recidivism rates for offenders who received the retroactive benefit of the guideline amendment implementing the Fair Sentencing Act of 2010, which reduced the statutory mandatory minimum penalties for crack co cocaine offenses. While Congress did not make the statutory changes retroactive, the Commission did make the ensuing 2011 guideline amendment retroactive. This publication compares the recidivism rates for those offenders who received a retroactive reduction in their sentences with the rates for those offenders who would have been eligible to seek a reduced sentence under the 2011 guideline amendment, but who served their full sentences before it went into effect. The commission conducted a similar analysis of its retroactive 2007 crack minus two amendment. In the latest publication, the Commission found that the recidivism rates were virtually identical, 37.9% for offenders who were released early through retroactive application of the Fair Sentencing Act Guideline Amendment and offenders who had served their full sentences before the guideline reduction retroactively took effect. Turning to the business of the day, uh, the Commission would like to thank the numerous individuals and groups who submitted thoughtful comments and recommendations during our most recent public comment periods. The next item of business is possible votes to promulgate proposed amendments. The General Counsel will advise the Commission on the first possible vote on the technical amendment. Thank you, Judge Pryor. This proposed amendment makes various technical changes to the guideline manual. First, it makes clarifying changes to Chapter 1, Part A, Subpart 1, and Application Note 2A to 2B11. Next, it makes technical changes to provide updated references to certain sections in the United States Code that were either restated in legislation or reclassified, and those are 2B1.5, 
uh, Appendix A, 2A, 3.5, 2X, 5.2, 5B, 1.3, and 5D, 1.3. Finally, the proposed amendment makes clerical changes to various listed guidelines and Appendix A. A motion to promulgate the proposed amendment with an effective date of November 1st, 2018, and technical and conforming amendment authority to staff is appropriate at this time. Is there a motion to promulgate the proposed amendment as suggested by the general counsel? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 Any nays? The motion is adopted and let the record reflect that four commissioners voted in favor of the motion. The general counsel will advise the commission on a possible vote on the marijuana equivalency amendment. This proposed amendment makes technical changes to 2D1.1, specifically replacing the term marijuana equivalency as the conversion factor for determining quantities, <coughs> penalties for controlled substances that are either not specifically referenced in the drug quantity table or when combining differing controlled substances. The, the term marijuana equivalency is, a, is replaced with the new term converted drug weight and this new conversion factor is added to all provisions of the drug quantity table and change the title of the drug equivalency table to drug conversion table. In addition, there are technical changes made throughout 2D1.1. A motion to promulgate the proposed amendment with an effective date of November 1st, 2018, and technical and conforming amendment authority to staff is appropriate at this time. Is there a motion to promulgate the proposed amendment as suggested by the general counsel? I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 Any nays? The motion is adopted and let the record reflect that four commissioners voted in favor of the motion. The general counsel will advise the commission on the first possible vote on the miscellaneous amendment. Yes, this amendment responds to recently enacted legislation and miscellaneous guideline issues and contains five parts. Part A responds to the Transnational Drug Trafficking Act by amending 2B5.3. Part B responds to the International Megan's Law to prevent child exploitation and other sexual crimes through advanced notification of Traveling Sex Offenders Act by amending 2A3.5, 2A3.6, and Appendix A. Part C responds to the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety Act for the, 21st, for the 21st Century Act by amending Appendix A. And Part, part D amends 2G 1.3 to clarify how the computer enhancement at subsection B3 interacts with its correlating commentary. And Part E responds to the Justice for All Reauthorization Act of 2016 by amending 5D 1.3. A motion to promulgate the amendment with an effective date of November 1st, 2018, and technical and conforming amendment authority to staff is in order at this time. Is there a motion to promulgate the proposed amendment as suggested by the general counsel? So moved. <clears throat> any second? second? Mm -hmm. Is there any discussion? Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 Any nays? The motion is adopted and re let the record reflect that four commissioners voted in favor of the motion. The General Counsel will now advise the Commission on a possible vote on the Tribal Issues Amendment. Yes. This proposed amendment is the result of the Commission's study of the May 2016 report of the Commission's Ad Hoc Tribal Issues Advisory Group and contains two parts. Part A would amend the commentary to 4A 1.3 to set forth a non-exhaustive list of factors for the Court to consider in determining whether and to what extent an upward departure based on a tribal court conviction is appropriate. Part B would amend the commentary of 1B1.1, which are application instructions, to provide a definition of court protection order that is derived from federal statute. It also makes technical and conforming changes to the commentary of 2B1.3 and 2L1.1. A motion to promulgate the proposed amendment with an effective date of November 1st, 2018, <clears throat> and with technical and conforming amendment authority to staff is appropriate at this time. Is there a motion to promulgate the proposed amendment as suggested by the general counsel? So moved as to both parts. 
Uh, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Vote on the motion. Uh, well, but before they, we do that, I want to say a few words about it. Let me start by thanking the members of the Tribal Issues Advisory Group for their recommendations and their 2016 report to the Commission and their expertise regarding this amendment. The six factors outlined in the amendment provide a framework for courts to use when determining whether an upward departure is appropriate to account for prior tribal convictions. Collectively, these factors balance the rights of defendants and the unique and important status of tribal courts. The amendment also provides a definition for the term court protection order, which incorporates the statutory definition of protection order. By adopting a clear definition, the guidelines will ensure that court protective orders, protection orders issued by tribal courts receive treatment consistent with that of other jurisdictions. Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 Any nays? Let, the motion is adopted and let the record reflect that four commissioners voted in favor of the amendment. The general counsel will now advise the commission on a possible vote on the acceptance of responsibility amendment. This proposed amendment amends the commentary to 3E1.1 to clarify how a defendant's challenge to relevant conduct should be considered in determining whether the defendant has accepted responsibility. Specifically, the proposed amendment would, would revise Application Note 1A to state that the fact that a defendant's challenge is unsuccessful does not necessarily establish that it was either a false denial or frivolous. A motion to promulgate the proposed amendment with an effective date of November 1, 2018 and technical and conforming amendment authority to staff is in order at this time. Is there a motion to promulgate the proposed amendment as suggested by the General Counsel? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? The Commission has heard concerns that some courts have interpreted the current commentary to Section 3E1.1 as automatically precluding the reduction for acceptance of responsibility when the defendant makes an unsuccessful, good-faith, non-frivolous challenge to relevant conduct. This amendment clarifies that the unsuccessful nature of a challenge to relevant conduct does not necessarily establish that the challenge was either a false denial or frivolous. Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 Any nays? The motion is adopted and let the record reflect that commissioners voted in, that at least that four commissioners voted in favor of the motion. The General Counsel will advise the Commission on a possible vote on the Bipartisan Budget Act Amendment. This proposed amendment responds to the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015, which among other things amended three existing criminal statutes concerning fraudulent claims under certain Social Security programs. The Act added new subdivisions prohibiting conspiracy to commit fraud for substantive offenses contained in 42 United States Code Sections 408, 1011, and 1383A. The proposed amendment would amend Appendix A so that these sections are referenced not only to 2B1.1, but also to the Conspiracy Guideline 2X1.1. The, the Act also amended those sections to add increased penalties for certain specified persons who commit fraud offenses under the relevant Social Security programs. A person who meets these statutory requirements and are convicted of a fraud offense under one of the three amended statutes may be imprisoned for not more than 10 years, which is double the otherwise applicable five-year penalty for other offenders. The proposed amendment would amend 2B1.1 to address cases in which a defendant was convicted under these specified statutes and the maximum term of 10 years imprisonment applies by adding an enhancement of four levels and a minimum offense level of 12 for such cases. It also adds commentary specifying that if the enhancement applies, the court should not apply an adjustment under 3B1.3, the abuse of position of trust enhancement. The proposed amendment also makes clarifying uh, technical and conforming changes to other provisions of 2B11 and its commentary. A motion to promulgate the proposed amendment with an effective date of November 1st, 2018 
and technical and conforming amendment authority to staff would be in order at this time. Is there a motion to promulgate the proposed amendment as suggested by the general counsel? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Before I comment on this amendment, I'd like to note the commission's appreciation for the constructive comment it received from the Senate Committee on Finance, the House Ways and Means Committee, the House Judiciary Committee, as well as the Social Security Administration regarding the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. We value their past and current important work on this topic. This amendment ensures that the guidelines reflect the Bipartisan Budget Act's increased penalties related to fraudulent claims under certain Social Security programs. The proposed sentencing enhancement in particular reflects the seriousness with which both Congress and the Commission view violations by defendants in positions of trust engaged in these sophisticated fraudulent schemes. Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Any nays? The motion is adopted and let the record reflect that four commissioners voted in favor of the motion. The general counsel will advise the commission on a possible vote on the illegal reentry guideline enhancements amendment. This proposed amendment contains two parts, parts A and B. Part A responds to a suggestion that the illegal reentry guideline enhancements for prior convictions contain a gap in coverage. Specifically, neither subsections B2 nor subsection B3 provide for an increase in the defendant's offense level in a situation where a defendant engaged in criminal conduct before being deported or ordered removed from the United States for the first time, but did not sustain a conviction or convictions for that criminal conduct until after he or she was first deported or ordered removed. Part A of the proposed amendment would amend 2L1.2 to cover this situation by revising subsection B2 so that its applicability determines on when the defendant engaged in the criminal conduct before he or she was first removed or ordered or deported, rather than whether the defendant sustained the resulting conviction before that event. Part A also makes other non-substantive conforming changes to the language of subsection B3. Part A would also amend the commentary to 2L1.2, adding an application note to provide that in the event that the conduct occurs both before and after deportation, only subsection B2 enhancement should be applied. Uh, part B of the proposed amendment responds to an issue that has arisen in litigation concerning how 2L1.2's enhancement for prior convictions apply in a situation where a defendant's prior conviction included a term of probation, parole, or supervised release that was subsequently revoked and an additional term of imprisonment imposed. Part B would revise the definition of sentence imposed in application note 2 of the commentary to 2L1.2 to clarify that consistent with the meaning of sentence of imprisonment under 4A1.2, the phrase sentence imposed as used in section 2L1.2 includes any term of imprisonment given upon revocation of probation, parole, or supervised release regardless of when that revocation occurred. A motion to promulgate the proposed amendment with an effective date of November 1st, 2018 and technical and conforming amendment authority to staff is appropriate. Is there a motion to promulgate the proposed amendment as suggested by the general counsel? I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? As many of you know, the commission passed a comprehensive amendment to the illegal reentry guideline in 2016. This amendment clarifies certain discrete application issues that have arisen in litigation and that have been brought to our attention by the Department of Justice. The amendment makes clear that the prior criminal conduct enhancement should apply regardless of when an illegal reentry offender's conviction is final. This amendment also makes clear that the defendants who commit criminal conduct before their first order of removal but who are not convicted until after that order is issued are subject to the relevant sentencing enhancements. Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 Any nays? The motion is adopted and let the record reflect that four commissioners voted in favor of the motion. The general counsel will advise the commission on a possible vote on the synthetic drugs amendment. 
This proposed amendment is a result of the Commission's multi-year study involving synthetic drugs, fentanyl, and fentanyl analogs. The proposed amendment contains three parts. Part A would amend the drug equivalency tables in 2D11 to adopt a class-based approach to account for synthetic cathinones, setting forth a single marijuana equivalency of 1 gram to 380 grams of marijuana, and making this class-based marijuana equivalency also applicable to methcathinone by deleting the specific reference to that drug from the drug equivalency tables. It also sets a minimum base offense level of 12 for cases involving synthetic cathinones and provides a departure provision based on the potency of the synthetic cathinone. Part B would amend the drug equivalency tables in 2D11 to adopt a class-based approach to account for synthetic cannabinoids. It sets a single marijuana equivalency applicable to cannabinoids to 1 gram is equal to 167 grams of marijuana. It adds a provision defining the term synthetic cannabinoid, provides for a minimum base offense level of 12, and a departure provision for certain cases involving synthetic cannabinoids. Finally, Part C of the proposed amendment would amend 2D1.1 in several ways to account for fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. It provides a definition of the term fentanyl analog, sets forth a single marijuana equivalency applicable to fentanyl analog of 1 gram is equal to 10 kilograms of marijuana, and specifies in the drug quantity table that the penalties relating to fentanyl apply to the substance identified by that specific chemical name applicable to fentanyl in statute. In, in addition, Part C of the proposed amendment amends 2D11 to provide a four-level enhancement in cases in which fentanyl or fentanyl analog is misrepresented or marketed as another substance. A motion to promulgate the proposed amendment with an effective date of November 1, 2018, and technical and conforming amendment authority to staff is appropriate. Is there a motion to promulgate the proposed amendment as suggested by the general counsel? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? The commission will now vote on a multi-part amendment regarding synthetic drugs, which includes but is not limited to synthetic cathinones, otherwise known as bath salts, synthetic cannabinoids, including but not limited to K2 or spice, fentanyl, and fentanyl analogs. This amendment draws upon public comment, expert testimony, and data analysis gathered during a multi-year study of synthetic drugs. Currently, many new synthetic drugs are not referenced in the federal sentencing guidelines. As a result, courts have faced expensive and re resource-intensive hearings. The amendment pending before the Commission today reflects the evolving nature of these new drugs. In addition, it will simplify and promote uniformity in federal sentencing. The amendment will also create a new guideline definition of the term fentanyl analog. The, the change effectively raises the guideline penalties for fentanyl analogs to a level more consistent with the current statutory penalty structure. To address the severe dangers posed by fentanyl, the amendment also creates a four-level sentencing enhancement for knowingly misrepresenting or knowingly marketing fentanyl or fentanyl analogs as another substance, which equates to an approximate 50 percent increase in sentence length. The new amendment also establishes drug ratios and minimum offense levels for two new classes of synthetic drugs, synthetic cathinones and synthetic cannabinoids. Following a multi-year study and series of public hearings and with experts, the Commission has determined that synthetic cathinones possess a common chemical structure that is sufficiently similar to treat as a single class of synthetic drugs. The Commission also found that while synthetic cannabinoids differ in chemical, chemical structure, the drugs induce similar, similar biological responses and share similar pharmacological effects. In proposing these new drug ratios, the Commission also considered, among other factors, the severity of the medical harms to the user, the current ratios applied in similar cases, known trafficking behaviors, and concerns for public safety. Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 Any nays? 
The motion is adopted and let the record reflect that four commissioners voted in favor of the motion. The general counsel will advise the commission on a uh, possible vote on the alternatives to incarceration for nonviolent first offenders amendment. This proposed amendment is a result of the commission's continued study of alternatives to incarceration. The proposed amendment amends the commentary to 5C1.1 to add a new application note stating that if a defendant is a nonviolent first offender and the applicable guideline ranges in zone A or B of the sentencing table, the court should consider imposing a sentence other than imprisonment. The application note defines the term nonviolent first offender as a defendant who has no prior convictions or any other comparable judicial dispositions of any kind and who did not use violence or credible threats of violence or possess a firearm or other dangerous weapon in connection with the offense of conviction. In addition, the proposed amendment amends the commentary to 5F1.2 to remove language instructing that electronic monitoring ordinarily should be used in connection with home detention. Alternative means of surveillance may be used so long as they are effective as electronic monitoring and surveillance necessary for effective use of home detention ordinarily requires electronic monitoring. Finally, the proposed amendment makes conforming changes to other provisions in Chapter 5. A motion to promulgate the proposed amendment with an effective date of November 1, 2018, and technical and conforming amendment authority to staff would be in order at this time. Is there a motion to promulgate the proposed amendment as suggested by the General Counsel? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? I'd like to discuss the Commission's reason for considering this new application note. The new application note provides that judges should consider alternative sentencing options for nonviolent first offenders whose applicable guideline range falls within zones A or B. Eligible defendants must not have any prior convictions and must not have used violence, credible threats of violence, or possessed a firearm or other dangerous weapon in the offense. This narrowly tailored amendment is consistent with the directive to the Commission in 28 U.S.C. Section 994J. Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 Any nays? The, com the motion is adopted and let the record reflect that four commissioners voted in favor of the motion. I would like to acknowledge the unique challenge that the Commission faced during the com current amendment cycle. The Sentencing Reform Act of 1984 contemplates that there will be seven voting members on the Commission appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. While setting sentencing policy is always difficult because it impacts the liberty of our fellow citizens, reaching consensus was particularly challenging and critical this amendment cycle. Under the statute, we need an affirmative vote of four commissioners to approve any pending amendments. Among the four of us here today, the unanimous agreement on this slate of amendments reflect even more collaboration and compromise than in a typical amendment cycle. I would like to thank my fellow commissioners for their time and service. We worked, we worked together to develop solutions that improve the federal sentencing guidelines in a manner that balances fairness, justice, fiscal responsibility, and public safety. I look forward to working with my colleagues to strengthen and to simplify the guidelines. Working together, we can continue our efforts to ensure clear and effective guidance for federal courts across the country. As one important part of that ongoing work, I would like to mention an upcoming event the Commission's National Seminar on the Federal Sentencing Guidelines in San Antonio, Texas. The seminar will take place from May 30th through June 1st. These annual trainings provide specialized instruction to probation officers, prosecutors, and defense attorneys on the guidelines. I look forward to seeing many of you there. Is there any further business before the Commission? Justice, I think I speak on behalf of the three commissioners here to thank you for your leadership. Uh, without your leadership, uh, it would have been impossible uh, to arrive at a consensus on these amendments. So thank you. Thank you. 
Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. Is there, <laughs> is there a second? Second. Vote on the motion by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion is adopted by voice vote and the meeting is adjourned. Have a great day.